Welcome to St Jude's Randwick on this eighth Sunday after Trinity. My name is Andrew Schmidt. It's a slightly uncertain time in the progress of the COVID pandemic at the moment, where we're not sure how things are going to pan out here in New South Wales. And as a result of that, we find ourselves doing a whole lot of different things uh, for church. We've recently restarted meeting up in person in the mornings. And so now each week we have a service at 10 a.m. Uh, on Sunday morning, as well as our 6 p.m. service, which is in the parish room. As well as that, we're meeting at 8 a.m. online through Zoom, and our 6 p.m. service is able to be accessed online as well. Plus, of course, we're producing the YouTube service that you have chosen to watch today. So we're doing a lot of different things to try to make sure that we can have Christian fellowship in whatever way people feel comfortable at the moment. Of course, I. It, I'd encourage you greatly to come along to be in person with us if you possibly can, but we know that there are many who don't feel ready for that yet. You have done a very good thing by tuning in today. You'll do a very good thing by joining us in person. Christian fellowship is a part of the Christian life. It's a part of the fight of faith. And that's what I'm speaking about today in uh, my sermon from the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, the fight of faith is something which is worth it because it's a fight that the Lord Jesus himself is the pioneer of. He has, he has led us in that fight. It's a fight for God's glory, and God's glory is something that is worth fighting for. So I hope that that is something that encourages you today, and I hope that you do know that uh, you've done a great thing by tuning in today. It'd be great to see you in church whenever you feel ready to do so. Uh, and can I also add, if you're tuning in to us for the first time, or if you're not someone who comes to us regularly on a Sunday uh, in person before the pandemic started, um, we would love to hear from you. And there's a way to contact us through our online connect card. You can find the link to that in the description of this video on YouTube. So please do say hello and give us the encouragement to know that uh, you've benefited from the service from St. Jude's here today. Let's go into church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Psalm 18, verses 9 and 10. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, so your praise reaches to the end of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us, therefore, confess our sins in penitence and faith, knowing that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us we earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life to the honour and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him, 
have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ordinary Sunday. Raise up your great power, Lord, and come among us to save us, that, although through our sins we are grievously hindered in running the race that is set before us, your plentiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us through the sufficiency of your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. The reading is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those who he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 169. Let my cry come to you, O Lord. O give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you, and deliver me according to your promise. My lips shall pour forth your praise, because you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall sing of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand be swift to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. Lord, I have longed for your salvation, and your law is my delight. O oh, let my soul live, that I may praise you, and let your judgments be my help. I have gone astray like a sheep that is lost. O oh, seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Hebrews today takes us to a stadium, to a race, and a great crowd of spectators. Now, if you're anything like me, your main experience of a stadium is as a spectator, sitting in the stands, willing your team on. Possibly, at times, getting frustrated if they're not performing, and of course, going wild with excitement when they succeed. I cannot imagine what it must feel like to be one of the players running onto the field in the middle of a stadium with tens of thousands of people watching you. And, and what it must be like for the footballer lining up to kick a penalty goal from the sidelines at full time when this penalty goal will make the difference between his team winning or losing the match. Or what it must be like for a tennis player waiting to receive serve when it's match point against them. At the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, the person chosen to carry the Olympic torch up to the cauldron to light the Olympic flame has often been a champion of yesteryear, or just an ordinary citizen perhaps who embodies the Olympic ideal in some way. But you might remember that at the Sydney 2000 Olympics, there was a slightly unusual decision taken to ask Kathy Freeman to light the flame before she had had what we all hoped was going to be her shining moment in the 400 metres race at that very Olympics. It would have been much safer to have someone light the cauldron who already had their gold medal in the bag. I cannot begin to imagine the pressure that she must have felt as she prepared to run the 400 metres final when she'd already lit the Olympic flame. Anything less than a gold medal would have been perhaps not a failure, but certainly deflating. Well, in the event, she won. And as she is still the only person to have lit the flame and won a gold medal at the same Olympics. Most of us will not experience what it's like to be a competitor in a stadium with thousands of people watching us from the stands. But if we're a Christian, Hebrews wants us to see that we are running in an infinitely more important race with spectators around us cheering us on. Only these spectators are not just punters along to watch the game. They are in fact the greats of yesteryear, willing us on to finish the same race that they themselves have finished already. Hebrews chapter 11 has taken us through the, the heroes of faith in God from the Old Testament. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Daniel, He's run out of time to say all the things that he wants to say about how they saw the reality of what God had promised and strove for it in spite of the earthly cost. Some of them received miracles in their earthly lives. Others, as I explained last week, did not receive any miracle in their earthly life. But all of them have in common that they died still waiting for the real climactic fulfilment of God's promises, which is the saving work of Jesus Christ. That's what Hebrews is getting at in chapter 11, verse 39, that they were commended for their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, because God had planned something better, that they should all be perfected together with us, us who have believed in the Lord Jesus. So when we read in chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, he means Noah, Moses, Elijah, Daniel. He means for us to picture them in the stands of the stadium. They finished the race, but now they are watching us avidly because they want to see how their brothers and sisters do. That's us. So he goes on, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the faith, the race marked out for us. 
Uh, now, does this actually mean that the saints of yesteryear, the people who have now gone to be with the Lord, can see everything that we do down here? Well, I don't think it necessarily means that. A friend of ours whose husband had passed away told of a conversation she had with a granddaughter. The granddaughter asked, can Grandpa see us down here? The grandma reflected for a moment and said, you know what? I don't think it would be heaven for Grandpa if he could see what I was doing with his money. Now, I think there's probably some truth in that tongue-in-cheek remark that the people who've gone to be with the Lord are at rest from their labours. It's completely up to God as to how much he reveals to them about what is going on down here. The point, though, is that we are united in faith with those who trusted God before us and who will rejoice to see us run and finish the same race that they finished. We should think of ourselves as running our race with them in the stands cheering us on. That's why he says, throw off whatever hinders us to run the race that God has marked out for us. But you know, with everything that we've read so far about the heroes of faith through chapter 11, there is still something missing. The absolute hero, the captain of the team, the one whose life of faith utterly dwarfs even the best efforts of the others. He is the greatest example of them all. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's telling us about the way that Jesus lived by faith at the critical moment of his crucifixion. Now, faith, remember, is... The conviction that God's promises are true, so that what is promised is real, even though we can't see it yet. Jesus voluntarily chose to endure his crucifixion. He could have stopped it at any time. At a human level, he had to endure the shame and humiliation, which I guess for the Son of God would have been even worse than the physical suffering. At a spiritual level, he had to endure the wrath of God for the sins of the world. He chose to endure these evils because he trusted God's promise that he would ultimately be rewarded with resurrection and the name that is above every name. We shouldn't think that this was somehow easy because he was the son of God. He was fully human. And as a human here on earth, he faced the same struggle that we do, that he couldn't yet see what God had promised. He had to take it by faith in God's word. For enduring the cross, in light of God's promises, Jesus is the ultimate example of faith, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. He is, by an infinite margin, the greatest human being who has ever lived. Not just because of his compassion and his love and his concern for the outsider, but because of his faith in God. Even before showing love and compassion to others, the fundamental task for a human being is to have faith in God. And in those terms, Jesus is the greatest. We are to fix our eyes on him. And for me, in the imagery of the stadium, if we're running the race and if the old heroes of faith are in the stands, it seems to me that Jesus is standing on the finish line, beckoning us. Come on. Come on. Keep running. It's not far to go now. We are to fix our eyes on him. Verse 3, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It's easy to forget, I think, that 
that Jesus faced constant opposition during his own earthly life. His crucifixion was simply the culmination of all that opposition that, that Jesus faced certainly during his three years of public ministry. Jesus is, is so well known these days as someone who reached out to the marginalised. And, and because our era rightly recognises that that is so important and so good, Jesus has a good reputation in that respect. And people in our era agree with him about that. But Jesus was also zealous for God. He loved his father. He hated to see the temple desecrated by money-making activities and the Sabbath twisted by man-centered legalism. Jesus was angry that people do not give his father the honor that is due to him for being our loving creator. Zeal for your house will consume me. It was written about Jesus. And you see, that is the core reason why he faced such opposition. Because fundamentally, whatever veneer they put on it, the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day did not have faith in God and did not love him. And so, of course, they hated his son. And they hated everything that Jesus was trying to do to invite people to have faith and to love the Heavenly Father. Jesus endured that opposition right to the end because he trusted his Father. We are being urged here by Hebrews to consider that, to think on the way that Jesus endured this opposition so that we also will not grow weary and lose heart. What would growing weary and losing heart look like? Probably it would look like getting slack with the basics of the Christian life, getting slack with your prayers, getting slack with attending church, getting slack in the fight against sin, getting slack with those parts of our life which only make sense if there is a heavenly reward for those who persevere in their trust in Christ. In your struggle against sin, verse 4, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. What does that mean? Well, I think literally he means that the congregation he's writing to have not yet had their faith put to the ultimate test of, are you willing to die for Jesus? Now, perhaps it's unlikely that any of us will be put to that test. But this is a verse that can sort us out. This is a verse that can give us some clarity about where we stand. When he talks about struggling against sin, are you in that struggle? Is keeping your life free from sin something that's worth fighting for? So many of the collects that we pray each week are prayers in which we ask God to keep our lives free from sin. Grant that this day we fall into no sin. This week, for example, in the collect, we acknowledge that our sins grievously hinder us from running the race before us. We see, in fact, in this week's collect, a direct allusion to Hebrews chapter 12. And so the collect asks us, because our, our sins so grievously hinder us, the collect asks God to deliver us by his grace and his sufficiency. The fight against sin, that is something that the authors of our prayer book really understood is, is worth it. Does it grieve us that there are parts of our lives that are displeasing to God because they are sinful? Being grieved at sin is, is different from just trying to be better or, or trying to be good, isn't it? Because trying to be better and trying to be good, they're things that we do for ourselves because we want to be proud of ourselves and, and because we think it will be useful to us if we're better. Fighting sin is something we do because we're conscious of our Heavenly Father. 
Are you in that fight? Even if we are very unlikely in, in our part of the world to be killed for our faith, it is clear from verse 4 that for a Christian, fighting sin is something that is worth it. I think here he means fighting sin both in the sense of bearing up under the opposition of sinful people who want to silence the gospel, who want to discourage us from doing those things that are distinctively Christian, and also personally fighting to resist sin in our own lives and, and, and so to live lives that are pleasing to God. Is that fight worth it for you? I really pray that it is, because Jesus died to free us from sin, both from its penalty and from its presence in our lives. Jesus is standing on the finish line of the race saying, don't give up, don't get slack, come on, it's not far to go. Verses 5 and 6 explain that, that even when we face opposition, this actually is the discipline that our Heavenly Father has planned and provided so that we can share in His holiness. Now, I'm going to talk more about that next week. In this passage, there is long-distance race imagery, as, as we've seen, but there is also the imagery of a fight. There is nothing more tiring than fighting whether it's actual physical fighting, of which I must say I've had very little experience in my life, but at least I've had enough experience, even at play or uh, mock fighting, to understand just how physically exhausting it is. But whether it's physical fighting or, or, or simply ongoing interpersonal conflict, it is exhausting. It is exhausting to be fighting. It's the most tiring of all human activities. You are only going to fight for something that is really worth it. The heroes of faith and Jesus himself say that fighting against sin to stay on track in the Christian life is worth it. It's worth it because of the heavenly reward. It's worth it because it brings honour to our great God. So let's stay in the fight of faith the fight against sin, and run hard into that stadium with all of the heroes cheering us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your Son, the Lord Jesus, who because of his faith in you, he is the greatest human being who has ever lived and the prime example to us of the faith that we ought to live out. Father, please, as we've seen in these last several weeks of Hebrews, please strengthen our faith, our conviction, that your promises are true even though we cannot see them yet. And Father, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, who showed this same faith in his own life. Help us to run hard into that stadium, not getting slack, but to continue in the fight of faith to the end. We pray in your Son's name. Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, your word reminds us that to you belongs all greatness and power, honour and glory, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. We know that in your hand is the life of every creature, and the breath of all mankind, and that you are righteous in all your ways and loving towards all that you have made. And so today, Lord, we ask once again for your mercy and compassion to be upon our hurting, broken world. Lord, as this pandemic continues on, we ask that your peace and comfort would be with the sick and suffering, that you would grant energy and strength to our healthcare workers and wisdom to our leaders. We pray also for your church at this time, that your spirit would be at work in all believers, enabling us to love and care for those around us in a manner worthy of Christ. 
Please give church leaders wisdom and compassion as they seek to shepherd their flocks and make decisions for the good of their people. Help them not to lead out of fear or insecurity, but to be humble, quick to listen, and compassionate in their actions and words. And may your word continue to go out among many, even in places where Christians cannot gather together. And so, Lord, we also pray for those who are persecuted for their faith, and we think especially of our brothers and sisters in China. We praise you for the growth of your church in that nation, even in the midst of such hostility and opposition to the gospel. And we pray that the gospel might continue to bear fruit, bringing many to salvation and new life in Christ. Please, Lord, strengthen struggling believers by your spirit and enable them to trust in your precious promises every day. May they know afresh the height, width, breadth and depth of your love for them and be given courage to stand firm for Jesus in every situation. We pray, Lord, for the work and ministries of Uni Church and Claremont College, both in our local area, and we commit them to you. We thank you for our ongoing partnership with Uni Church, especially for the provision of leaders for our children's ministries. Please bless their work at this time, enable them to make good ministry decisions, and grant all the students and leaders continued energy to serve and love you and others. And we pray also for the whole Claremont College community, that you would grant teachers energy, passion, perseverance and love, and that the students would be safe, healthy and supported in their learning. Lord, we know that there are many people in our communities who live in fear and who feel trapped in unsafe situations. While much of this violence and harm happens behind closed doors, we know, Lord, that you see, love and care for those who are hurting. So, Lord, we ask that you would protect and heal those who are victims of domestic and family violence or who have experienced trauma in the past. Please give them the courage, wisdom and support they need to seek help and a way out where possible. And please strengthen organisations who provide these services and bring change to our society so that families can flourish in health and safety. And Father, we also pray at this time for the family and friends of Robert Maple Brown, who remember his life and his passing. We pray especially for Sue and her children and all those who are close to Robert, asking that your peace and comfort would be with them today and in the coming days and weeks. May they know the power of your presence and the constancy of your love, even as they walk through this dark valley. And Lord, may all who grieve, who are in pain, trouble, or need of any kind, turn to you in trust and hope, remembering that you are close to the brokenhearted. As we look to the triumph of our Lord Jesus over sin and the grave, may we all be filled with joy, peace, and hope this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray for the peace of the world and the welfare of your holy church. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our Archbishop Glenn, our Bishop Michael, our Rector Andrew, and for all the clergy and people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray that we may share with justice the resources of the earth and live in trust and goodwill with one another. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the aged and the infirm, for widows and orphans, and for the sick and suffering. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the poor and oppressed, for prisoners and captives, and for all who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for ourselves and for each other. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We praise you, Lord God, for the communion of saints and for the glorious hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear these words of scripture to prepare us for sharing in the Lord's Supper. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Let us pray together. We, we do, do not, not presume to come to your table, table merciful Lord, Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and be in us. Amen. to God for the gifts of the congregation that have been given during the week. Blessed are you, Lord God our Father. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed, Blessed be, be God, God forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is it right to give him thanks, thanks and praise. And praise. All glory and honour, thanks and praise be yours now and always, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Father, we pray that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, his almighty Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup 
and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessing and honour and glory and love are yours forever and ever. We who are many are one body, for we, for we all share, share in the one, one bread. bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Father, we who believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and have received these pledges of his love, thank you because you graciously feed us with the spiritual food of his body and his blood. By this you assure us of your love and forgiveness, and that we and all your faithful people are true members of his body and of each other in him. Remember your church which you have purchased by his blood, and gather it in holiness into the kingdom you have prepared for it. Make us faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus and his resurrection, that at his coming we may go out with great joy to meet him and be found worthy to worship with all your saints forever. Father, Father we, we offer ourselves to you, to you as, as a living, living sacrifice, sacrifice through Jesus Christ, Christ our Lord. Send, send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen.
of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with each other, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In, In the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.